next reading of the Poetry Center in this summer series is Ted Hughes. And that is Wednesday, July the 13th at 8 o'clock. And it'll be in, not in this building, it'll be in the lecture hall, room 100. Tonight, we're presenting the poet Raymond Patterson. He has been called a poet of the psychological aspects of the revolution in black thought that surfaced in the 1960s. He has written, there is enough grief energy in the blackness of the whitest Negro to incinerate America. The 1960s are over, but the issues continue, and Patterson continues to voice them. He is also a sophisticated writer, with the subtlety and humor implied by the title of his book, 26 Ways of Looking at a Black Man, and other poems. For me, he has said, writing poetry is an exploration of the possibilities of experience. A poem written is a poem discovered, providing useful knowledge about the territory we travel through. Raymond Patterson was born in New York City, educated at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania and at New York University. He served in the Army of the United States. He has been a children's supervisor in Youth House for Boys in New York City, an instructor in English at Benedict College, Columbia, South Carolina, a, a teacher of English in New York City public schools, a lecturer at City College of the City University of New York. He has received a Borstone Mountain Award and a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. At present, he is teaching at City College, New York City. He is working on a book-length poem on Phyllis Wheatley. Rather overwhelming, also, and I'm so glad I have uh, these poems with me to keep me in touch with with who I am. I'll begin with uh, performance. The keeper unlocks the cage, and I come out with a bound dressed in my animal rage. To dance these sad bones round, a grin strapped to my snout. It is my time to act the play of the dark and the bars, the cue of the keeper's kick lurking behind each trick, the spotlights flashing like stars. The music's in the fur, the humor's in the chance that I am dangerous that I know what I dance, that we are who we are, that someone may forget. But I am no one's pet. The keeper wears a scar. Words. Each night with words to wall out prison walls, brick by word, brick by word, from darkness lifting into wordless space, words from syllables of rage, to rise through caged tears towards the clear speech of stars. Can you see now in the dark, in the top of the makeshift scaffolding, the prisoner lifting the final words into place, some jailer below shaking his keys and shouting. A 
When I Awoke. This is a poem that's been anthologized a good deal. It's a kind of accident, the way it came to be written. When I awoke. When I awoke, she said, lie still, do not move. They are all dead, she said. Who, I said. The world, she said. I had better go, I said. Why, she said. What good will it do? I have to see, I said. Those days. Those days I come home raving, my head filled with some grave nonsense like Chop down the walls, put the cat in the oven. They need us in Peru. You wait until my head clears, offering yes, 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 until I see you, always, the first thing we must do. I've been racing along up to this poem. It's called teaching the animals to talk. Uh, there's been a good deal of interest lately in teaching chimpanzees to talk and porpoises. And I don't know whether it's a good idea or not. In fact, I'm pretty sure it isn't. At, at least uh, any serious kind of talk. teaching the animals to talk. By and by, Papa Bear comes home, and he wants quiet, snarls at the children, snaps at his wife, who is learning to weep, sits in his special seat, dines on a big steak, goes to the TV den, snoozes, dreams about his life, jumps awake, muses, must get more berries into my diet. She's reading that book again. I'm losing my hair. Well, I need my sleep. Tomorrow's another day. God knows it's a wilderness out there. Uh, one spring, looking out of the window, I, I saw uh, a group of boys trying to retrieve a kite that had been caught in a tree in a playground area. And it was an all-day affair. One group would come and make various attempts at getting the kite down and they would leave, and another group would come. And this poem deals with that, the lost kite. A kite is caught in a tree. Who will get it down? It is a lost kite no one owns, a bright red challenge to everyone. A boy parks his bike near the tree tries to catch the kite by jumping straight up. He takes running leaps and finally gives up. The kite nods gently in the wind. More boys come. Some look around for long sticks. One climbs another's shoulders and reaches up both arms. The others stand around. A boy with sneakers begins to climb the tree. He climbs to the limb where the kite hangs. He clings there a while. Three girls pass with a dog on a leash. The others look up from the ground. The boy shakes the limb up and down. The kite leaps and dips from the length of string caught by the limb far from the boy, far from the ground. The boy climbs down. The boy with the bike is gone. 
It is soon afternoon. Other boys come. One says his father will get the kite down when he comes home. After some talk, someone throws a stick to knock the kite down. Someone throws a stone. It becomes a game to hit the kite with stones. They all take aim. Soon the kite is gone. Scraps of red paper lie on the ground. The broken frame still held to the tree by a string caught on the end of the limb. The boys have gone. Two boys come riding a bike. They look at the tree. Soon they are gone. Then it is dark. The wind is down. No one else comes. A kite is caught in a tree, stranded on the moon. Years ago, I used to live on the Lower East Side, uh, 6th Street to be exact, just off 2nd Avenue. And uh, this poem deals with an experience there. It has to do with uh, encountering uh, you know, the panhandlers that you, you meet along the Bowery and in that area. Uh, when I first moved to, the, to that community, uh, I was an easy mark for panhandlers. Uh, a man would come up to me with his hand out, obviously in need you know, of a dime for a cup of soup or a cup of coffee, and I would go into my pocket you know, until I be began to see that they really weren't using this money for, for coffee or soup. You know. Then I began to feel that I was being used. No one likes to, to be used. And so I, I began to get tough. I began to, to brush, the, brush them off, anticipate their requests for money, step aside, or even uh, get angry. Uh, one, one evening, I was coming out of the subway at Houston Street. There was a man sitting at, on the pavement at the exit, I had to almost I had to step over him to get out, and he had lying beside him his crutch and in front of him a hat. And as I came out, he lifted the hat up and I said, "Oh, I don't have any." You know, kept walking, and I had taken about three or four steps, and he started cursing at me and shouting at me. And I stopped in my tracks and I turned and I looked at him. I was. I was stunned, I guess. You know, he was yelling with such conviction that he convinced me that, or at least it gave me reason to feel that perhaps he felt that I owed him something. And I, I went on. I went on. Well, a year or two later, I, this poem developed. And this, is, this goes back a few years. Second Avenue Encounter. The old guy cursed me for the coin I held, etched with his lone shark's tooth a yellow poem, catching my startled soul on the thorn of his tongue. Blocking my path, that reeking jaw of pain cursed me and mocked me, my necktie knotted throat my thoughtless mornings slipping into suits, my sliding into shoes that always fit, hoisting his leg and wagging the wretched stump as how he grubs towards death up to his groin. Cursed my disease, so brought to my knees I cried, may God forgive me, I am betrayed like you, and kissed him where his cheek was wet with dew and dropped my coin into his wounded side.
coming out here, one seems, one feels very far away from the city. I guess that's New York City. Uh, th this very short poem called "The City" is kind of reaction to maybe all of the all of the negative things we we associate with city life. The city. Where people who live alone are murdered by a thief. Where someone hears it done, falling off to sleep. To dream police who come and find the body gone. Where no one need know, no one. Of course, there's another side of New York. Of course, there always is another side. This is a winter poem, Snow. Snow never learns. Every winter, snow comes to New York, New York, to do the town. A year's pay in his pocket from odd jobbing around the country. Dishwashing in Duluth, flat fixing in southwest Fargo and snow gets taken. First, somebody sells snow Brooklyn Bridge. Then, somebody sells snow Grants too. The Empire State Building, two lions off the Fifth Avenue Library steps, a carriage house in Harlem, you name it, the whole Manhattan Island to the last worn nickel, then dump snow into the gutter. The same old confidence game over and over again. For the birds, for lunatics and lovers, but snow never learns. Every winter the city waits and snow comes back with new money. I am um, very interested in history. Uh, and I, I find that concern uh, influencing the subject matter of the poems that I am working on currently. Uh, I'd like to read a, a poem, well, written a number of years ago, but it, it involves that, that interest in history. This poem is about uh, the poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And it was written uh, for the 100th anniversary of his birth. That was in uh, 1972, five years ago. The poem mentions people and events, and perhaps that's not a good thing when these people and events are not generally known. But uh, the poem may, may hold together. Dunbar. 1872. Dunbar, you were born this year, and Douglas's house in Rochester burned, his papers lost, and well we all might mourn this these seven years from slavery, suddenly turned rotten as Freedmen's Bureau beef. The Klan spawned violence our patience, a lesson not yet learned. The bank failing, our colored troops recalled. The grief when Douglas dies and Booker Washington barters compromise for each week's lynched black life. To see hope shattered with a poet's eyes, black suffering hammered into law, 
the White House shut against black cries. And splendid Du Bois home from Germany to draw deep resolution from the souls of black folk, fearlessly to climb thundering Niagara, sensate power, to ponder that deafening roar and more. 1906. Paul, at 34, you are in your grave. How young you died. This year the crime is being black. Events ride black men. Brownsville and Atlanta rage. The earth quakes. Hope lies exhausted. You can forget this sad time. But we go onward into a modern age of wonders, yet see only darkness deepening for us all. I feel a dread which nothing can assuage. In Dayton, it is the same. I keep your books. Your photograph hangs in the hall. We do not argue now whether you wrote best your Negro rhymes or your poems more traditional, nor how in life you could turn sorrow into jest. Dear poet, take your rest. This is a poem also written for an individual for uh, Malcolm X. Whose name was Malcolm Little at that moment. When they shot Malcolm Little down on the stage of the Audubon Ballroom, when his life ran out through bullet holes like the people running out when the murder began, his blood soaked the floor, one drop found a crack through the stark pounding thunder, slipped under the stage and began its journey. Burrowed through concrete into the cellar, dropped down darkness, exploding like quicksilver pellets of light, panicking rats, paralyzing cockroaches, tunneled through rubble and wrecks of foundations, the rocks that buttressed the bowels of the city, flowed into pipes and power lines, the mains and cables of the city, a thousand fiery seeds. At that moment, those who drank water where he entered those who cooked food where he passed, those who burned light while he listened, those who were talking as he went knew he was water running out of faucets, gas running out of jets, power running out of sockets, meaning running along taut wires to the hungers of their living. It is said whole slums of clotted Harlem plumbing groaned and sundered free that day and disconnected gas and light went on and on and on. They rushed his riddled body on a stretcher to the hospital, but the police were too late. It had already happened. I've been rushing through to get to this part of my reading for this evening, I guess. Uh, I've been working for a few, a few years now on a poem, a book-length poem uh, about on the, on the life of Phyllis Wheatley, the 18th century black colonial poet. She appears in some recent anthologies of American literature. During her lifetime, however, she was the 
best known American poet in England and throughout Europe. Certainly in New England, she was the poet. Uh, it is believed that she was born uh, around uh, 1770, pardon me, uh, somewhere around 1768. I have my dates correct. She, certainly, she, she, she arrived in Boston, but she arrived in Boston in 1761. I'm getting my, 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 my facts confused. Uh, at the age of seven or eight. And she was purchased by a, uh, a family, the Wheatley family. Uh, they detected very early that she was an unusual child. She very soon learned to read and read English and to write. And by the time she was 19, uh, she had been invited to London, England, by the Countess of Huntington, who had been impressed by the work of this young slave poet. Uh, my poem covers Phyllis's life. Uh, the first section, or the first two sections I'd like to read. The first section uh, finds her in England at the age of 19. She is being entertained by uh, Lord Dartmouth, who was George III's Secretary of State for the Colonies. Uh, the second section that I will read finds Phyllis re return to Boston. Uh, her mistress had become ill and Phyllis had to return before her stay in England uh, was uh, complete. Phyllis talks through, throughout, throughout the poem. The first section, she's speaking to uh, a group of people that she has been introduced to. Dearest Phyllis, Lord Dartmouth, you do me great honor. I am your humble servant. Yet fear London these days does overspend its charity on so small a poetess as I dare claim to be. Your kind regard I hope in time to merit and shall remain ever anxious to improve the faults of youth and want of greater study you now discern. What notice I may own, in truth I owe my mistress, Susanna Wheatley, dear wife of John Wheatley, tailor, residing in King Street, Boston. Indeed, I owe her my life. She took me a child of seven, I'm told, into her keep, a wretched slave, ignorant of who I was, but half alive speechless from sufferings so deep I cannot make them still. She gave me my life, a refuge in her home, her own dear children, Mary and Nathaniel, to nurse my pain, dispel my fears with smiles until my childish mind opened in their son. And I, through imitation, strove to bind myself to them. Their words, the first glad sounds I made. Their manners I took as mine, waiting at table, 
fetching Susanna's gown, joining the Sabbath song. And for my soul's sharp thirst, my mistress gave God's word, his grace and love, her deeds, its purest fountain. In time, with characters rude, I learned to write my name and soon began my prayers, reading them as well. Events judged wondrous by their speed, but lagged behind my gratitude. Such progress through the scriptures, sped by memory and sweet Mary's whim, begged leave to undertake in sacred texts, histories, geographies, the ancient myths and science of the heavens, the limits of my intellect. As well, I know some Latin, that perfect tongue. Finding in Ovid's Niobe a moral I might tell, though less ambitious poems have found some approval among the cultured of Boston. Clearly, I am favored to pursue my muse, where others may not go beyond that ornament judged natural and near the hearth's care. The muse be women, we are told, though in New England, it seems not so. Like Terence, I am African, a slave. Titles I may not properly deserve. Owning of Africa, but this dark skin. Of all that binds one to the past, I am unhappily free. Of that first home, I remember nothing. No face, no scene, no tongue, no creed, no one. A curtain hides that past, withholding who I was before my birth upon a Boston dock in 1761. Well known the tales of sufferings in the trade. Of my misfortune, I am dumb. What ruthless slavers came to raid our town? Did some chief weave a coffle out of war with captured princes, noblemen at times, set like black jewels in that wretched band, the mothers weeping, their babes plucked from their arms? The young ones herded off like lambs bleating in the dark, the tread on weary tread that led us groaning on that journey to a slave port by the sea, where we are sorted, branded, traded, made ready for our fate, the feeble cast aside, the women culled to serve the captain's plate. What din of tongues, what loathsome smells, chained in the cramped dark hole, the storm-battered ship bearing us on, the fear we should be eaten in the end. And some, when brought on deck, jump overboard, and mothers smother their young, and others will to die, singing a death song, trusting the soul to fly swiftly home. And some will not to die. But I remember none of that journey, how I came from Africa, by God's will, that kindles me, a small dark flame, an emblem burning for souls not free. Though unsteadily in such harsh winds our Boston winters make the price of glorious New England spring, yet I do persevere, but dread the night no terror if I wake without some light as often when I'm ill. However well I school myself, I fear the dark will smother me and keep a candle near to pass the time in thoughts like some lost nightingale borne on fancy's wings. Such times 
Towards dawn when dreams outrace my pen, this need imagination has to clothe the dark in palliaments of light, I will compose a poem. Perhaps God keeps the past from me. He holds all curtains shut on all we do not know, disclosing in his time eternity. Though rebel minds uneasy in restraint may cast strange images of future scenes or past forgotten times imperfectly, thus to me frequent and unbidden comes a figure in a doorway greeting the dawn. I feel it is my mother, her arms lift. She pours from her hands a liquid ribbon kindled by the sun. Though English soil proclaims me free, in truth, I am a servant, yet am served. Bound to those I love, enriched by every strand, few are as blessed as I in serving God or man. What is the lot of slaves? This ocean void, my presence here, held by subtler chains, free men suffer harsher ways. But I am braceleted by love, and lacking such stays would be swept away, surely, and have drowned. From this true liberty, from an awakened soul have come my poems in gratitude, as that one on the late Reverend Mr. Whitfield, sweet angel of Christ in Cambridge, chaplain to the Countess of Huntington, gaining her sympathy for a book soon published in London. May it dispel some doubt in the African here recently set free, which state is best, and plead modestly for his humanity, that from instruction much may come to merit praise, a darker intellect, a deeper soul towards God may rise. Though it be argued well abroad and in Boston, where frequently, if not all free, though many a dark face in the crowd, and steps forth occasionally an ingenious African. That I am judged an argument for my race, my lord, kind gentlemen and ladies, newfound friends, you honor me. And may I speak with a convincing tongue at home as here, for reasoned liberty, there resting much goodwill on either side, much we share. The same sea does touch us both, unbound the channels of the winds. This globe, our common ground, one sun, sweet soul, does shine upon under the all-seeing eye of God. May he in time redress all wrong and spread his peace over the colonies and the crown. This ends part one. Uh, there are many things that I'd like to say about Phyllis and her life. Uh, She lived on King Street in Boston. Uh, at the head of King Street was where the Boston Massacre took place. Uh, at the head of King Street was the State House, where uh, many decisions involving the revolution occurred. Uh, she, during the war, she wrote a poem to Washington, to George Washington, 
And he invited her, in appreciation for her poem, he invited her to visit his camp uh, at Cambridge during the uh, siege of Boston. When Phyllis was in, in London before returning and being involved in the events of the Revolutionary War, when she was in London, Benjamin Franklin visited her, who was then the uh, American agent in London. The second part of the poem, Phyllis is at home in Boston, living on King Street. And the second part, presents her life up to the Boston Tea Party. Unknowable are the ways of providence that while I thrive in England, my mistress fails and beckons me to put aside my modest lace, the liberty and crown of London's praise, and sail home to read more clear the farewell gift London's Lord Mayor gave, that true book of life, John Milton's Paradise Lost. God punishes my pride, a devil's snare. They say Susanna cried from her bed for me, holding my portrait. See, look at my Phyllis. Does she not seem as though she would speak to me? so great her need. What could I do but come, affection urging me home, servant and child as one, love the stronger bond. In twice heavy chains, in mild celebrity, to come a second time upon that proud, troubled, almost island, Boston. The damp October chill blowing inland the cloaky smother freighted with myriad spells, the din of ships, the thronged harbor below old North Spire, seagulls vanning the air above orchard and farm, transcending sounds from shore to gently lifting hills beneath the first rays of sun. Town whose streets I learned to love, Corn Hill to Old South, Marlborough to Newberry to Orange, past the guard house and out from town. King Street to State House and Bookstore, Tremont to Common, Queen Street to Jail, School Street to Burying Ground. Dear huddle building, sparrow grown, your weathered wood, your rich red brick, now seems to be the color of old blood where England keeps her soldiers and her law by musket, sword, and bayonet, where first I came a slave, was sold for so much gold, gained all I have. Where now we hear liberty shouted in the streets, down with tyranny a watch cry in the night. By day the carriages and crowds, the noise of trade, the yelping curs, the loud parades, the sons of liberty. Fife and drum, fife and drum, as squads of red coats come down King Street, by our door the cobbles ring. The times dwarfing our household's single care, Susanna ill, a tear in the eye of a storm. And riding that storm like eagles, Sam Adams, Boston's brewer of beer and rebellion, James Otis, Dr. Warren, an elegant John Hancock, that rich merchant who in happier times joined Governor Hutchins to declare my poems the work of my own hand, a slave in a family in this town. The governor, an excellent scholar, his mansion plundered and burned, his books destroyed for England's Stamp Act of 65. And others 
whose names are bugles and rallying cries to Mohawk ruffians, Liberty Boys, tavern rogues who pull buildings down, Stockbridge Indians, dock brawlers, shipyard workers, rope walk men, the fugitive, landless, lawless, indentured, slaves, runaways, and deserter redcoats, who risk little, risking all, bold on rum and talk of rebellion by radical men, sober, respectable smugglers, rich shopkeepers, citizens with fat free port purses, cursing taxes, plotting their worst at Green Dragon, bunch of grapes, salutation. And those loyal to the crown called Tories, who wish to stay English, keep English law, claim England home, rich by heritage, accustomed to debate, who fear no evil greater than mob rule, men of culture, taste, learning, books, land, power, enlightenment in New England, who made Boston flower, though thorned with discontent. Oaths and curses in King Street Taunts of lobster when redcoats pass, where once rang long live the king over the common, and lanterns lit the liberty tree for good King George, now harried, hard-faced British soldiers tramp to black regimental drummers. King Street, scene of the first wound struck when soldiers quartered on the town, sore with abuse, fired at a mob brandishing cudgels, ice shards, barrel staves, led by Crispus Attucks, the first shot down. And others fell dead, the church towers belling alarms, the town drum beating citizens to arms. Black Attucks of Farmingham, runaway slave and seaman, called Michael Johnson when death disclosed his name. That Indian half-Negro and altogether rowdy who should have been strangled before he was born, one Tory claimed. And Patrick Carr from Ireland, Samuel Gray, James Caldwell, and Samuel Maverick, rowdies all, the Tories claimed, outsiders, all wantonly slain the radicals swear, preferring that version by Paul Revere. To lie in state at Fenil Hall, then born with pageantry to a martyr's grave, mourned by multitudes, the town amazed, bells tolling miles around, the shops closed, distinction gone, seeing what end freedom might have. This wound opened again. Boston loud with pain from townhouse to Long Wharf, as if the name King Street gave offense, a vein that must be bled in our distress. Such sickly scenes beget contagion. In the street near Cox and Berry, a man set upon by ruffians a merchant I know by name, to whom I had addressed a poem when God took his infant son. This gentleman had shown me every courtesy, knocked down his frock coat grime, his wig awry, blood on his cheek. Tory, the ruffians cried, running when the soldiers came. We speak in whispers to suppress our shame but pass by for shame, for shame. These families are the first to leave at great loss to all, selling shops and homes, their windows lined, the graves of loved ones, the smiles of old friends abandoned for new lives in Halifax, England, fortunate to flee Boston before many would run. 
This morning the book arrives from London with likeness of author. I must hold my joy. That scalloped cap sits too high, flaunting its ribbon. That fillet at my throat. The times grow virulent. We keep our shutters closed. So much is changed. John Wheatley, often gone haggling for homespun, or below his hands idled in the ban on English goods, with some break at great profit and hazard windows broken by a ban. Mr. William Claiborne to John Wheatley do a fine dove-colored cloth coat and breeches lined with sky-blue silk and gilt buttons, small ditto, four, sixteen, and six. Captain Samuel W. Peach to John Wheatley do a cinnamon great coat, a salmon-colored suit and brocade waistcoat lined with white silk and silk cravat, 12, 6, and 8. And one apprentice flown, whereabouts unknown, shears and needle case, ditto. Susanna's health improves, now wanes, feverish yet she will not eat, cuppings and they bleed her when strong purges fail. Their powders let her sleep. The doctor's gone, she cries and dreams, God's mercy. I sigh, amen, and bathe her brow. Under pale, her eyes roll. Susanna, will you die? I dare not see you dead, yet fear you may, dear Christ, abandon me. You must not. No, still, I am your servant, still, dead, dead, deaths. I cannot breathe what breaths left in this room. Frail Abigail, did I swoon? Nights come close and twine about the heart. A wind sweeps our untidy town, lays brine and wood smoke on the tongue. Frost, then snow, a sudden thaw, light drumming from the eaves. The town lay puddled and sickly. Susanna, will you stay while I am ill? I drift vagrantly, and winter wears on. Tarnishes. Sundays at Old South we pray, but hear more politics than God's word ring to gallery. The English tea ships in port brew bitter on every tongue. Now few officers come to prayer, none join in our hymns. So mad with talk of taxes, would Boston cheer St. Luke's gospel, Mary and Joseph? to Bethlehem to be taxed this year? Some thought not, and swelled Old South to hear Sam Adams say, this meeting can do nothing more to save the country, and rushed forth howling to the docks, disguised as Indians, boarded the tea ship, and dumped the noisome cargo into the harbor. And that was done. Some thought the mob had gone too far. Some hailed Hancock King and vowed their work had just begun. We hold our breaths as ships speed news to England and share in silence that crime, for none give evidence in court nor dare. Thus none go to jail. We rend English law or wear it as it suits. This new fashion, can God commend? Begins now, Lord of misrule. Our mild days grow severe. The new year makes to freeze beneath a great fall of snow. 
Frost thickens the panes, the sky tints weak vermilion. The hottest radicals have cool blood and keep indoors, hugging their fires. We learned the crown would have our leaders home for tea. But no one dares against the crown, against the town, boil water for the king. The sons of liberty flaunt. We flaunt English law. The radicals gain and will do more, routing Tories from their homes. Our merchants know great business selling guns. The matter steeps. No act from England. We are between the blow and pain. That comes double. Susanna dies. With wrenching, her soul springs free to paradise. Dear Christ, to know our chains by such liberty. Would I have flown from her so eagerly, set free to die, grieving and alone? I shiver when they put her in the ground and will not warm for days, but weep. We progress in the momentary round. Lamps sentinel our streets. The watch patrol their dark ways, darker now and cold. Then spring, for our abuse of law, the town is under martial rule. The port closed down, no middle ground. Been very patient, thank you.